How many of you like wonderful scenery? You love to look at scenery. Well, I have one here that you can look at. I won't keep it here very long because you won't look at me. How do you feel when you see a sight like that? Refreshed. Yeah, peaceful, calm. And you know, mountains can be so incredibly beautiful. There's another mountain here. Now, how do you feel about this one? Not so good? You know, because every mountain is not beautiful. Every mountain does not make us feel calm. There's some mountains we face that are not, they're scary. They're scary mountains. You don't even want to go up there, right? You want to get away. Well, today we're going to talk about mountain moving ministry. Mountain moving ministry, our posture dependence upon God. And the reality is, if you're in ministry, you are in mountain moving ministry. But they're not your mountains. They're other people's mountains. And God is giving you the opportunity to have a part in a significant way in someone's life by helping them move their mountains. And the main point we're going to look at today, prayers of faith unleashes, whoops, sorry about that, unleash spiritual power that moves mountains. That's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to look at this um, passage in Mark chapter 9, the one about the healing of the demonic boy. Okay, we know this. You know that it's a very common, common. In fact, it's in Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's so important. And we're going to find out, you know, I, I look at the disciples, I say, what did you, what? You guys really blew it. But the more I studied the passage, I realized I am one of those disciples who blow it all the time for certain reasons that we often lose sight of. And that's what we want to look at today. So we're going to look at two principles. Moving mountains requires spiritual power, and moving mountain requires genuine faith. So let's look at this a bit. This is Mark 19, and I'll read this with us. When they came down to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. So this is quite a scenario. This is a scenario. Now give me this scenario. Here it is. Not long before that, Peter, James, and John with Jesus went up to a mountain. And you know what that mountain is called often? The Mount of Transfiguration, right? What an experience. That left behind nine disciples. See, what they didn't realize is that they would be facing a mountain of their own. But they would realize soon that they were not able to climb that mountain. And we're going to look at why is that. This, this is really set up. I mean, the scenario is there. There's a scenario that God ordained, I believe, to lead these nine marginalized disciples to have a significant ministry. You know, to be honest, people didn't know where Jesus was. I mean, Jesus' cell phone battery had died. Really, the GPS system was broken. They had no idea where he was. They couldn't contact him. And so the people wanted Jesus, but they couldn't find Jesus. They only found the nine. And how the nine responds is very similar to how we respond when someone comes to us. So that was their own mountain. So there's a number of truths we can learn from this. And the first one is the mountain was someone else's mountain. That's the first truth. If you look at this, Jesus 
ask them the question. And here's what happens. A man comes up and he answers, Teacher, I brought you my son, who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I ask your disciples to drive out the spirit. But they could not. Whose mountain was this? Was it the disciples' mountain? No. It was the mountain of the Father. And this father was desperate. I mean desperate. Because his son's well-being was at stake. In fact, it, his life was at stake, at stake. And he had tried everything. And he was so desperate for a solution that he no longer had. You know, the world is full of desperate people all around us. We may not know it. But they're desperate. They're going through life. They've tried their own way, but they have come to a point where they're desperate. All their solutions are going. Then God sends them in your path. You have an option for significant ministry. Will you be able to help them remove the mountain? See, so that's the question we're facing. So the, another thing we can learn from this is not only was the mountain not their mountain, it was someone else's, the mountain was a ministry mountain that God had sovereignly given to them. As I said, the other three guys who would step in and lead the charge were not around. These little nine that you hardly hear about in scriptures doing anything except messing up, were there. And they had this opportunity. It was something, a mountain they had not expected, but it was there. And I really believe that's what God does to us. That's what God does to you. He put you in a situation that you did not expect, but God ordained it, and someone plops in your lap and you say, hmm, should I take advantage of this opportunity to minister? You could have that. And that, again, as I said before, at IGSL, you're going to get that. You're going to get that within this campus. You're going to get it in your TAM. You're going to get it on ministry week. You're going to get it in your church. Many opportunities. But do we grab them? Do, do we have the power, the spiritual power in our lives to be able to help them. So that's the issue that we have right now. Do they have the spiritual power? Why is that? Because there's another observation here. This mountain involves spiritual powers. It says it involves spiritual powers. The powers of the evil one, of the spirits. You know, it's all over the place. Significant ministry involves going against spiritual forces. That's what it is. In fact, Paul, and you know this verse, in Ephesians chapter 6, he reminds us, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Whoa, that's kind of heavy. That's heavy. And that's what we're involved in. But sometimes we make it such a physical Thing, that we don't understand the spiritual forces behind it. That's the issues that we lack. And therefore, the encouragement for us, when you see a, a ministry opportunity, see the spiritual forces behind them. Because they're there. Because if there's any spiritual ministry God has for you, there is a spiritual force that wants you to stop. And they're going to rob you of power they're going to rob you of that opportunity. In fact, the sad part about this whole story, and you know this, did the nine disciples have spiritual power to overcome the spiritual powers against them? Yes or no? Did they? Did they? Did they have it? 
Yes. Oh, they did? Were they able to drive it out? Did they have the power? No. If they had the power, they would drive it out. They did not have the power. Oh, you don't think so, huh? I know, Helen. You, you have a reason you're saying that. They could have had the power. They had the potential to have the power, but they did not have the power. But if you look at the disciples, they had what it took to drive out demons. You know why? They were trained. Who were they trained by? Jesus. Did they ever see a dream? Jesus drive out demons? Yeah, even the garrison demon. You know, all the pigs drowned and he saw a tremendous, wow! They were trained by the best in the world. Had they ever succeeded at driving out demons? When was the trove sent out? Before or after this? Before. Before this, this trove was sent out. And you know what Mark says in Mark chapter 6? When they came back, they rejoiced. They said, many, they were able to drive out many demons. Do they have success? So they had training, they had success. What else did they have? They had authority. When Jesus called them in Mark chapter 3, what did he say he was going to give them? He called them to be his disciples, to be with him, and to, to preach and to have authority over demons and heal diseases. Wow, they had authority. And not only did they have this spiritual authority that was vested in them, that they could possess, they had physicianal authority because they were Jesus' disciples. So why did that crowd come to them? Because they had physicianal authority as Jesus' disciple. People respected them. They expected them to do this. Now the problem is they had all these things, but what did they not have? They didn't have spiritual power. That's the problem. They had all these things, but they didn't have spiritual power. Hmm. You know, I tell you what, when you have those things, when you are trained and I just held, when you go out and have success, and you preach and people applaud you, when you go out and people come to know the Lord, and when you have many people in your discipleship group, and they are multiplying, when you have all that stuff, you have success. And then you become a graduate, or you're a pastor, or you're a teacher, and you only have positional authority. You have all this stuff, but you don't have power. Because power doesn't come that way. And this was a problem with the disciples. They had all these things around them, you know what it made them? It didn't make them powerful. It made them prideful. Really. If you don't believe me, you know when they argued about who's the greatest? Okay. This account in Mark is three verses after the end of this account. You know how many verses in Luke? Three verses after this account. In Mark? Matthew, eight verses after this account. So you get the point? You don't think these are trying to make a point here? I tell you what, I'm so guilty of this. When you get those things, when you get that training, when you get success, when you get positions of people who respect you and expect you to do great things, you can become proud, and you put your trust in those things instead of in where it really belongs. Then you find out it doesn't work. Have you ever given a sermon twice? The first time it went great, and the second time it fell flat on its face? And you wondered what happened? You did the same, you said the same stuff, but you lacked something. You lacked the power. Because once we put trust in those things, that's what happened, and that's what happened to them. So I tell you what, it's a trap of Satan when we rely on the things like that. It's an absolutely trap, and he zaps us of power. So I don't care how much you learn here, how much success you've ever had or will have, or how much 
authority and position you rise in, it means nothing. It guarantees nothing. That is not the source of spiritual power. So, we go to this summary, this, the, the point that we are trying to make here, and just a quick summary, is this. Moving mountains is a God-given ministry to help others with their unmovable mountains. It's God-given. Secondly, mountains involve spiritual evil forces that require spiritual power to overcome. And thirdly, our knowledge, successes, authority, prestige will never be enough to provide power. It will fade so quickly. So now we have to look at the second principle we're going to talk about. Moving mountain requires genuine faith. The first part is all about the inability of the disciples. In fact, it's repeated twice in Matthew, twice in the Mark account, and once in Luke. The disciples were unable. That's a key theme here. But there's a greater theme, and the greater theme is faith, is power through faith. That's the greater theme. So, let's look at this. We can go to the next slide. Keep on going. Oh, back, back some more. Okay. Oh, one more. 19. Okay. This is Jesus' response. Wow. Let's talk about some responses, some lessons about faith. The first one is that Jesus expected believers to believe. That makes sense, right? Don't you expect believers to believe? And the first thing you have to notice here, he was upset. He was ticked off. He was you can just feel it. Not look at the words. Look at the words. I bet the tone of his voice. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So he was a little upset, okay? More than a little. I mean, he was mad at everybody. I don't get this. I said, come on, Jesus. You're getting a little upset here. You're God. Don't control yourself. Doesn't the Bible say be patient? It doesn't look like he's very patient. And I don't know who he's mad at, but remember, they were arguing, the religious leaders and the disciples. Well, maybe he's upset at those guys. So they're arguing how to get this thing done. Said, Man, you guys all messed up. You always think about the wrong thing. It's not about all those processes and go through this and step one and step two. It's about faith. So he's upset. I can understand that a bit. These are the religious leaders. They're the disciples. But you know what I can't understand? Why did he get so upset at the Father? Come on, Jesus. Go to the next one. This is what I don't get. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he said. It has often thrown him into the fire to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. That guy made a mistake. Words are important, but he shouldn't have said if you can. But he did say that. Now, Jesus will have ticked off now. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for who believes. So immediately the boy's father explained, I do believe, but help me in my unbelief. Well, that's very much like us. Why did Jesus get so upset? I mean, come on, Jesus. I think it's this. Who did he say, if you can? Who was he referring to? Who was he referring to? God, the Creator. If you can, you're asking me? I'm God. If you can, if you only knew that I was God. So he's ticked off. If you can, everything 
is possible for, for one who believes. Who does the one believe in? Who is it? Who? God. Jesus. That's the point. He's not saying just believe in something. Don't believe that it will happen. It's believe in Jesus. And the point is this. For all of us, it's the same. If we believe, who's going to do it? God. Jesus. So that's why he's ticked off at us. And he's ticked off at me. Because I don't believe very much. So he's ticked off. He gets ticked off at us. What are you, what are you getting ticked off, Jesus? Now I understand. Because when I don't believe, I'm saying, Jesus, you cannot. And that's why his anger... And sometimes I think I have good reason not to believe. But the point is, that's not true. And that's the anger that comes out. He is upset. And I'm ashamed before God for how much I don't believe him. There's another thing we can find out here from this passage. Jesus demonstrates the power of belief. Now, there's a difference to demonstrate the power of the belief and demonstrate a process to drive out a demon. Okay? If you think it was the process, how Jesus says, Be gone! And I'm sure it looks good, and I'm sure the disciples say, when they went there, Spirit, be gone! But it's not the process. It's the faith, the power that he demonstrated. He rebuked the demon. Uh, next slide. You can see here, he rebuked the demon, he commanded the demon, and the demon left. That's the power. It wasn't how he stood. It wasn't his hands. It wasn't it just a simple statement of faith that was so powerful that there was no thing he could do. It leads us to the third point. Jesus teaches that it's genuine faith that will move mountains. Now you go to the next slide. It's a genuine faith because this is getting, and this is a very interesting encounter. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples said, why couldn't we drive it out? Isn't that something? Even after all this, the disciples were clueless why they were powerless. Amazing, right? It happens to us too. We don't know why things went well. I did everything, and it happens just the same way. But they were really clueless why they were powerless. And then Jesus begins to explain why. He says this. He replied, this kind can come out only by prayer. That's Mark's account. You learn more from Matthew's. He replied, because you have so little faith. Truly I tell to you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing is impossible to you. You can move other people's mountains through faith. But it's not the faith. And this provides actually a really good balance. Prayer and faith. Prayer and faith. They go together. Um, so what it is, it's not prayers. It's prayers of faith. And how many times have I been guilty to give cursory prayers when I'm in a situation? They're prayers, but not of faith. Maybe the prayers of obedience, maybe the prayers of habit, maybe the prayers of this, but they're not prayers of faith. And that's what Jesus is saying. You lack prayer, and Matthew says you lack faith. So you lack prayers of faith, is what it's saying. And this, when it says littleness of faith, is one Greek word, and it means inadequate faith. Inadequate, that's what it really means. It's insufficient. It doesn't get the job done. It's imperfect faith. And that's why I call it genuine faith. Prayers of faith, sorry about that. Prayers of faith unleash spiritual power that moves mountains. Prayers of faith, not prayers. Not nebulous faith, but prayers of faith that ask for specific things. 
I tell you what, for me, one of the signs of inadequate faith is lack of prayer. <laughs> it just is. When I can tell when we pray as an LT, when we really pray with faith, man, I can tell because our meetings really go. And we made a commitment as an LT that after every chapel we will have prayer and fasting. So we keep this edge. Um, that's what we need. So in other words, you cannot move mountains without genuine faith. Genuine faith unleashes spiritual power that moves mountains. That's what we're at where we're at today. You know, God has given each of us mountains to move. And I know we often focus on our own mountains. We often do, oh, we got a mountain, we believe God to move my mountain. But this mountain moving ministry is not about your mountains. It's about these desperate people out there who have spiritual needs, but we need spiritual power to make those needs. And therefore, we need to pray in faith. Prayer in faith. And so God has really convicted me as I studied this. How often do I miss ministry? Because I haven't trusted God. And he throws things in front of us. And it's amazing. So I was preparing this yesterday morning. I said, Lord, I'm not even going to begin till I commit this day to you in faith. You know, don't say I do that every day, okay? But I said, you know, Lord, you're convicting me of this. So I'm not standing up as anyone that's a great at all. I'll be a good example of someone who's not. But, so I did. Uh, so I had a dentist appointment yesterday, and I had something I had to get fixed, a bag of mine. So I went to the dentist, and I had to wait for the bag to get done. So I went at crossings, and I ate. I went in to eat. And I parked my car along the side of the street. So I went and ate. I was so hungry, I ate at two different places. <laughs> That's something, man. Right next to each other. So I'm sure those guys are, what type of guy is this? He looks so thin, and then he's eating two different places. But I did. It took me a while. When I came out, I had lost. My hunger was lost now. When I went out, I had lost my car. I wasn't there anymore. <laughs> It wasn't very funny, guys, so don't laugh too much. <laughs> but it had been impounded, so I'm looking for my car, and I'm walking around, and, and some guy points on the, on the pavement, and there's a sheet laying there. So I go pick it up. It had been impounded. Oh, no. Now, let me tell you what I would normally do. I would have got mad. Ah, what did that happen? I mean... I gotta prepare for this thing tomorrow. I'm leaving next week for the U.S. I haven't had a day off. I need, I get so, man, you stupid gaff, what'd you do that for? You know? I didn't have that at all. It's so funny. It's, I didn't, I just had peace. So I went in and got some money. I figured, I just felt God was in this. It was something that, it wasn't my normal reaction. So I get in a taxi. I get in one taxi, flag it down. I said, we're going to Pasig. He looks at me, Pasig. Yeah, Pasig. <laughs> yeah, that's what I said too when I saw that. Pasig, oh my. <laughs> so I got in, no, I got in the car. I got in the taxi and I said, Pasig. He said, get out. <laughs> so I got out. He didn't want to take me. Traffic, he said, get out of here. So I got out. I flagged down another taxi. I got in, he took me, and I said, uh, I need to go to impounded car. And he said, oh, I know all about that. I said, why? Did it happen to you? And he said, yes. It happened to me myself. I knew exactly where to take you. I knew all this stuff. So I got talking to this guy, nice guy. He, has a lot of, he had problems in his life, all this stuff. So I began to talk to him about his spiritual life and stuff, and he said, you know what? My daughter is born again. Ooh. Good. So I said, I talked to him. He said, are you born again? I said, yeah. Wow, really? So I got to share the gospel with him. I got to give him, and when I left, he was a very happy person. He said, you made my day. 
Of course, I gave him a little tip. That made his day a little bit more. <laughs> I'm not sure whether, I don't know the money or the spiritual stuff. I don't know. But anyway, God saw me because his birthday on July 18th, he said, that's my birthday present. So what I'm trying to say, that's not me typically, but because God is saying, commit this day by faith in the Lord. It is funny how God brought a person and little mountain for you and me to spiritually minister to. And I was able to. But if I wasn't, and I was nice and carnal, I wouldn't want to talk to that guy. I want to just be mad. And I missed the opportunity. So, what I like for you today is in closing, how often do you do ministry without prayers of faith? That's my point. How often do we do that? That's what we have to ask the Lord about. Because if you go to town every week, so faithful, checking off your report, but you're not going in faith, you're going out of obedience. Obedience is good, but faith is better, right? Yes. Faith and obedience is even the best. So go with faith. If you're going to go on ministry week, you're just going to go. Are you going to trust God for something great? Are you going to be spiritually ready for those opportunities God will provide if you're spiritually ready. But if you're not, he's not going to provide them or they're going to be right in front of your nose and you're not going to see them. That's where we're at. And just think about it. Don't rely upon your training. Don't rely because you're a success ready to go and someone pat you on the back after a sermon and I'm pretty good. But rely upon Jesus. He can do it. So I guess bow in prayer and ask God, what does he want you to pray about right now for a ministry that you're in that he, he, he wants you to trust him for? Prayer of faith. Take some time to do that right now. Or to come before you and I may mean, have to admit, and maybe many here would admit, they're very much like the nine disciples. Yeah, trained, yeah, successful, yes, have authority, but they're clueless why they are powerless at times. And when that happens to us, Lord, how much more power, spiritual power we might have if we really have courage of faith. And trust you to do it. It's not us. Faith is not power. Spiritual power comes from you, but prayers of faith at least is a spiritual power that comes from you to help us move mountains. Thank you, Lord, for your word. It's so deep. There's many more things in here, I'm sure, that we have we can discover, but thank you for those things that you have revealed to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.